Welcome, welcome. Hey, if you're brand new, I want to say a big welcome to you. And then also, I want to say a shout out to our online campus right now. Eli and Cynthia are watching from Billings, Montana. And I love that you guys are on. And uh, cool. Hey, get this. Last hour, uh, we had uh, 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 one of the men who were serving our country on the USS Theodore Roosevelt watching our online service, which I thought was really cool. Hey, if you've ever wondered, how do you get connected here? How does this become a home church for you? Really a home like that you know you belong to? Uh, the answer to that question is come to what we call Next Step and then our growth track. Now Next Step is called Next Step with Chuck. That's me. It's happening next week at 1230. It's up in the London. So if you go out here and go up, it's up in the London Institute. And I tell my story. I tell the story of Crossroads. And we talk about how you can really connect and have this church be home. Now, we always serve lunch at this. But because of the date next week, we are going to have a special Cinco de Mayo lunch. So, you know, let me ask you a question. What's better than tacos? The answer, free tacos. So uh, uh, they're going to be out there. And, and so we're going to have tacos. We're going to have fun. And, and so you can come. You don't have to RSVP. You just come bring your kids. We have stuff for your kids. So plan to come and bring friends. See you next week, 1230 at Next Step. But I want to go into something that's pretty heavy right now. So I want to ask some questions that get you ready to talk about what we're going to look at in the book of Revelation. So here's the question. Have you ever experienced evil? Now, I mean, seriously, like really experienced evil. And I know a lot of you have. Maybe you were laying in bed at night and woke up and something had you by the throat or something was pushing on your chest and yet no one was there. But it was real. Maybe something in the shadows, you knew it was there, but there was nothing there, but you knew it was there and you could sense it. Maybe it was that nightmare that just kept hanging on and hanging on and you couldn't shake the feeling of it. Evil. The Bible teaches there is a devil. The Bible teaches there are demons. And by the way, what the Bible says is true. There is a devil and there are demonic beings that seek to reenact terror in your life, to seek to take you down, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly. Um, one time that I experienced evil was I went to visit a college-age girl and, uh, in her mom's condominium, and when I got there, I didn't know what I was going to experience, but what happened is she was demon-possessed. I had read about it, I had heard about it, I had never seen it before, but the demon manifested in a way you couldn't miss it, and I experienced real evil, vile evil, right in my very presence. And even though I was shocked by it and wasn't ready, I knew that God was with me, and I knew Jesus had me, and God used me, Jesus used me, and I cast the demon out, and the girl's free. By the way, she's free to this day from that. Yeah. And um, she said to me, as soon as the demon had come out and she was free, she said this, I can't have these in my home anymore. Will you take them? And I said, what are these? And so she came out with a stack of very demonic witchcraft books and a picture that was so demonic, it actually sent chills. And she goes, I can't have them here. And I said, okay, I'll take them. I drove home. Pam didn't know what I had gone through. I didn't know what I was going to go through. And I got to the house and I opened the door. And Pam was sitting in the living room where she couldn't see the front door, but she yelled to me, I don't know what you have in your hands, but get it out of this house. And I said, Pam, you got to see this. She said, no, I don't want to see it. And I don't want it in our house. You've got to get it out. And, and I said, well, I said, Pam, you got to hear what happened. And I said, but I'm going to burn them. And she goes, well, I'm not going to be in the room. And she ran into the bedroom. So I sat down and I lit the fire. Now, here's what's weird. I was thinking about this. I don't know why I didn't put praise music on. But it was silent. I mean, it was silent except for the crackling of the fire. And then I put the first book on and you could hear the dogs in the neighborhood go crazy. Now, when I'm talking about howling, you know how like they howl for a siren? This is like 10 times worse, but it's every dog. I don't mean one or two. They are going nuts. And it was the weird, weirdest, eeriest feeling ever. I couldn't burn the books fast enough. I couldn't burn the picture quick enough. But when the last one went out, all the dogs stopped. And in that moment, in that moment, I thought, okay, wow, there is a God. And I knew that. And there is evil. And we're going to talk about three things that if they're true of you, 
you will be able to overcome evil. Now, I want to tell you, it's at the end of the message. I want you to listen when we get there. Three things, if they're true of you, you'll be able to overcome evil. Let's pray. Father, I know that there is an enemy out there. I know there's the thief that's come, as Jesus, you said, to steal and to kill and to destroy. But you want us to have life. You want us to know freedom. You want us to have you. And I know that what the Bible teaches is so true, that when we're a born-again Christian, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. I know, God, that what you tell us is true, that if you're for us, then nothing can be against us. I know you've made us more than conquerors. And may we understand that and the reality of that today, for now, and for that time that's coming very, very soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, where we're at in the book of Revelations is this. Uh, John the Apostle had been caught up into heaven. And he's holding a, he sees God holding a scroll in his hand. And on that scroll are seven wax seals. And when each seal is broken, Jesus is going to break them. Then, then something happens on the earth that is God's will of judgment for this world. And every time something, one of these occurs, we get a step closer to actually the last days, the end of days and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in that moment, we see Jesus break the first seal, break the second seal, and things happen here on this planet. Then when the seventh seal is broken, it begins the sounding of seven trumpets. So there are seven seals, then there's seven trumpets, and each trumpet actually is a, a signal of something that's about to happen on planet Earth. Now, back then, they used trumpets to signal things, to let things be known. Uh, by the way, I, I had some of our team come to me and say, hey, we use trumpets today to signal things. And you might say, wait, really, we do? I'm about to show you. You're about to hear a trumpet, and I want to ask you, what does this signal is going to happen? All right, listen to this. Okay, what's coming when you hear that? Football and nachos. Yeah, um, yeah, no, no, so we know that. Like there's all these trumpet sounds we have now and you're going, oh, football or, or you know, whatever else is gonna happen. Well, back then, uh, uh, that's what happened in John's day. So even in our day, so these trumpets signal something that's gonna come. And the first trumpet and the second trumpet and the third trumpet uh, signal what's probably a, a comment from outer space impacting the earth in a devastating way. And I showed you last week, scientifically, we know that the very description in the book of Revelation happened on Jupiter and will happen on earth one day. And then the next trumpet blows and we see the ecological disaster that occurs from those three impacts. And then we come to the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. And, and before they blow, the reality of what they are is so bad, an archangel in heaven cries in terror. He cries in terror. And, and, and what, what you're going to see in Revelation 8, 13 is this angel's reaction to what's coming upon the world. It says, then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, look at this word, woe, woe, woe. Now, the New Testament is written in Koine Greek. This word in Greek is not just the word woe, it's a scream of terror. He screams in terror, and he screams in terror, and he screams in terror. Why? Because of the remaining blast of the three trumpets of the angels uh, who are about to sound. The fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, and seventh trumpet are so horrible. What happens on earth is so bad that an angel is terrified at it. Why? Because angels care, angels care about people. Demons are fallen angels that hate people. But angels care about people. And what the world will experience, what people will have to go through is that bad. So what is it? Uh, the fifth trumpet's this. The fifth trumpet is an evil horde. An evil horde. It's in Revelation chapter 9. And what happens is an angel comes and opens up the abyss. And the abyss is a, a, a prison where, where angels are, or demons are in prison. And they come out. And there's so many coming out, they can't be counted. And they come out. And the limits that are on demons today are taken off. By and large, they're taken off. And they come to torment and terrorize people on this planet. Jesus, when he was walking the earth, he confronted a legion of demons. And they begged him not to go to the abyss. Begged him not to send them there. 
The abyss is a place that's so bad, demons don't want to go there. And after being in that place, after being in prison there, and finally being set free, and most of the limits taken off from them, they come out hellbent on, on wreaking havoc on people. Now, what you need to know is this, is while they come out to hurt people, that God has actually said they cannot hurt Christians. And look what it says in Revelation chapter 9. It says, they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men of God who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 says when you become a Christian, when you're a born-again Christian, that you are sealed by God with the Holy Spirit. And then greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Uh, In 1 John 5, 18, we're given this promise. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who who was born of God, God keeps him. And look at this, the evil one does not touch him. The word touch in the Greek is not the word touch in the English. It's the word to attach to. So demons can try to interact with us if you're a born-again believer, but they can't hold on to you. They can't attach to you. So why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And and while today we're protected by God with the Holy Spirit, then it's going to matter even more. Now I want you to think about in the book of Joel, it says when those demons come, they sneak through windows into people's bedrooms. So if you're a, a Christian woman who's a Christian and you're a wife, and your husband's not a Christian. If you were living in this time, when you're laying in bed, the demon will dive on him and attack him, and you'll be able to get up and go, in the name of Jesus Christ, be gone, and it has to leave. During that time, we are going to be very popular. For that five-month period, we're going to be popular. You're going to be eating at Chili's, and a demon's going to attack somebody. You're going to, in the name of Christ, be gone. It'll leave, and you just eat, and people are, yeah. You know that junior hire that's been really disrespectful? A demon attacks him. And you go, catch you in five minutes, dude. (laughs) But when that time comes, they come without most of the limits that they've had. And they come terrorizing and tormenting. and, And people cry and they scream for death, but they can't find it. It's a horrible time to be alive. And that's why an angel in heaven cries out in terror over it. That's the fifth trumpet. And then the sixth trumpet blows. And the sixth trumpet is this, the evil of war. The evil of war. That all of a sudden, mankind breaks out in a war that is so horrible that one-third of everybody who's alive at that time on this planet dies. That kind of carnage takes place. That kind of devastation is enacted. Uh, Obviously, the soldiers die in huge numbers, but obviously, too, man, people are caught in the crossfire, and lives are lost, and people people pay a horrible price. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 9. It says these words, and the four angels who had been prepared for the, and I want you to notice this, this is important, the hour and day and month and year. Notice how specific God is here. This will happen at a certain hour, on a particular day, on a certain month, at an exact year. Now why is that there? Well God wants you to know this is not symbolic. God wants you to know this is not poetry. God wants you to know this is a real event that will take place on a day and a time that God has marked on a calendar. It's going to happen then. And you need to understand, eight times in the book of Revelation, it says that these things must take place. And to understand Revelation and to understand the times you live in, you have to know that. And it says, and they were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. Now notice this again. He said, there's 200 million, and I heard that number. It's a real number. Now back when John wrote Revelation, I told you this last week, there were just about 200 million people on the entire planet. The entire population of Earth at that time was 200 million. So when people read this in 90 AD, they were like, well, well, what does this mean? Will the whole world be in war? And then 100 years later, they were saying, I don't get it. Augustine at 300 said, this seems impossible to have an army of 200 million. And, and in 1500, I already told you too, the French Academy of Science said the Bible's not true and they didn't use this as one piece of evidence. They said it's impossible there would ever be a time on the Earth's planet where we could amass an army of 200 million. Well, you already know today that's, that's easily possible, right? 
You know that China could build an army of 200 million. India could build an army of 200 million. I mean, if they were groups allied together, they could have that many. And they will. They will, because everything the Bible says will happen. And, and by the way, then, when the evil of war comes, it's devastating. Angels cry in terror. You know, sometimes we read words like that and we go, wow, you know what, I guess it'll be bad. And that's because most of us have never been at war. I sat with a soldier who fought for our country in World War II. And he sat there saying, I can't talk about it. I just can't talk about it. My dad was uh, in the Air Force during the Vietnam War, and I watched men who were devastated by what they saw in combat. And then many people today have been a part of serving and defending our country in the Middle East. And, and you know what I want to say is that, you know, there's a price they pay. And they pay that price for our freedom. And, and you know, if that's you today, I want you to know we honor you because that, that's something you went through for us. But there are men and women who have gone to war and they see how evil war is, how bad war is, and there's no doubt about it. And so what you need to know and I need to always keep in mind is it, it, takes, it takes a toll. Uh, we actually have a term for it today, and you already know what that term is. It's called post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's where now your body can't cope, your brain can't cope with the horrors you see. And that's why an angel screams in terror at the second to last war that would ever be fought, and it's a bad one. It's a bad one, and that's the sixth trumpet. Then the seventh trumpet blows, and I want you to see this. The seventh trumpet is one that causes an angel to scream in terror, but I want you to see what I believe it is, and you're going to wrestle this through. I believe it's this. It's the rapture of the church and Satan trapped on earth. Now, obviously, the rapture of the church is awesome, but not for the world. See, when the church is raptured and Satan is cast out of heaven and now is trapped on earth, the, the earth is held. The people on earth are at the mercy of the one who shows no mercy. He's not going to show any mercy. And he can't get away. And he knows his time is short. But I want you to think about why this is an evil time in the world. It's an evil time in the world because the church is gone. Now, by, if you're brand new, you might be saying, well, what does that mean? I, you probably aren't opening your eyes to the reality of the church. Uh, the church is a force for good in a world that's evil. The church is a force of light in a world of darkness. Right now, who is it that is the most effective in fighting slavery and sex trafficking? You want to know the answer? The church. Yeah, that's right, the church. Who is it that's effective in feeding those who are trapped in extreme poverty? It's the church. You take what the church does, then you take every other non-Christian organization out there, and all of them put together doesn't do what the church does in bringing and feeding the hungry. Uh, matter of fact, that's not just the church universal. It's you. It's you, Crossroads. We are a part of that. Two weeks ago, I, I, I planned to come before this 11 o'clock service and say, can you, can you sponsor a child who uh, is trapped in extreme poverty and give them hope and give them a way out. And so that was my plan. And all of you who are at the 11 o'clock service then, though, then know what happened. The Saturday night service, the traditional service, and the 9 o'clock service, they took all the kids from you. Right? Yeah. Um, so there's a waiting list. There's a waiting list. And now right around 1,000 children are being cared for. And we want to see that be 1,500 and then 2,000. Because why? That's what churches do. That's what churches do. Medical care, food. Uh, uh, by the way, just locally in our area, 400 families a month get food. And there's Royal Family Kids Camp where children who are put in the foster system because of evil. And they feel like they didn't have value and they've been hurt badly. You know what? We take those kids to camp every year. All the ones who want to go, and boy, they want to go. And they find out they're loved and cared for. By the way, those of you who go to Royal Family and do that, thank you. But I want to say something. If you haven't gone, you ought to go. And I'll tell you, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to come home so tired you can't believe it. And number two, you're going to come home so blessed you can't expect how greatly you'll be blessed because you went and loved on a child who needs love. And, and then we have a mentoring program for that. And when the rapture happens, all that's gone. And a world that didn't want the church gets a world without the church, and it's not going to be a very good world. 
And, and then Satan is cast down. Now, in Revelation chapter 10, 11, and 12, we have this described. That's how big this moment in, in the world's existence is. And so an angel, an archangel, descends in Revelation 10. And he cries out with a loud voice that causes seven thunders to roar. He's so loud. And then he says these words, Behold, the mystery is finished. And the delay is over, which are the servants the prophets have told you about. And he says, the mystery is finished, and the delay is over at the sounding of the seventh angel. The seventh angel holds the seventh trumpet. There are seven trumpets. Now, I want to see if you can answer this question. If there are seven trumpets, what's the last trumpet? Okay, am I, okay, try it again. If there are seven trumpets, what's the last trumpet? The seventh, right? And after that, in the book of Revelation, there's no more trumpets. So what you need to know is that's what this angel says. An archangel cries out with a loud voice that the mystery is finished, the delay is over, and then at the, at the last trumpet, all this happens. And after the last trumpet, it's time for the church to get its reward. Why? Because we're caught up into heaven. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, we have the rapture described. And it says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Did you catch this? That in Revelation 10, the angel said the mystery is over. In 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the rapture, it says, calls it a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed, which means we'll be transformed if we're alive into a perfect body. In a moment, in the twinkling of time, when does it happen? At the last trumpet. At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed and we will become perfect at that point now notice that it's called a mystery and it occurs at the last trumpet that's what it's talking about the rapture when the church is caught up into heaven all Christians disappear from the earth in first Thessalonians it says this about the rapture for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel. Revelation 10, we have the voice of an archangel. And with the trumpet of God. And he talks about the last trumpet. In Revelation 12, we have the last trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And if you were reading this, the Bible, not in English, but in Latin, that word right there would be raptured. That's where we get the theological term raptured. The church will be raptured together with him and the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So when that happens, we're caught up into heaven. And when that happens, we're in a place of celebration. But the world is left without the church. But even worse, Satan is cast out of heaven. Why? Because what's he doing in heaven right now? We're going to see in a minute. He's up there accusing us, accusing you, accusing me. Day and night before God. Saying, God, how could you love Chuck? Look what he's done. How could he love and he'll name you? Look what you've done. He asked for Peter. He said, I want to sift Peter. He went after Job. And he's up there being the accuser. That's one of the, the things the devil is. He's the accuser. And some of you have heard his voice saying you're worthless and, and your life has no value and no one loves you and no one cares about you. And, 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 and all these hateful things said to you, that's the accuser. But he'll be cast down. So in Revelation chapter 12, we see there's no longer room for him in heaven any longer. And it says there was a war in heaven after the rapture. And Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, who's the devil. And the dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Why? Because when the church goes there, there's no room for the devil anymore. And he and his demons are cast out of heaven. And at that point then, he can't accuse us anymore. And we find victory. Now I'm going to get, what are those three things that give you victory now and will give you victory then? What are those three things? I hope you write them down. We're going to find them in the next two verses. So in Revelation 12, 9, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, because of the rapture, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. So that's what he does day and night, but no longer, not at this point. And why do we overcome? Look what it says in verse 11. And they overcame, all of us who have this true of us. If you have these three, three, three things true, you're gonna overcome evil now and then. They overcame him, the devil, because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. So those three things give you victory. And I'm gonna ask you, are they true of you? Those three things cause you to be born again. 
That's what it means to be born again. How do you become born again? These three things have to be true of you. And the first one is this. The first one is because of the blood of the lamb. When you go under the blood of the lamb, you come under God's protection. And that's why you have victory over the devil and the demonic. And that's why you have victory in life, because of God's protection. Now, what is this pointing back to? This is pointing back to what happened. Way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel, the Jewish people, were enslaved in Egypt, and God is telling the Egyptians to let them go, and they won't let them go. And so God then begins to bring ten plagues on Pharaoh and on Egypt until they finally let the children of Israel go. And so the first plague happens, the second plague happens, and the third plague happens to everybody. Everybody. I want you to catch that. Even the children of Israel experience it. Then God says, no more. And he puts a hand of protection on the Jewish people. And the fourth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth plague hit the Egyptians, but not, not the children of Israel. They're under protection, even though they're still in the land of Egypt. Like, we're going to be under protection, even though we'll be in this world. Then the tenth plague. The worst of all. And God says, I'm going to offer grace to anyone. To anyone. To the Egyptians. To the Jews. To anyone who chooses to come under my protection. And I'm going to offer grace. You can choose it or not choose it. And so what happens, he says, if you want my grace, what you need to do is you need to sacrifice a lamb, which would be symbolic of what Jesus would do on the cross, being the lamb of God, one day he would die for us. You need to take that blood, put it on the doorpost of your house, and then when the destroying angel comes, if I see that blood there, I will pass over, because you've chosen grace. You've chosen to be under the blood of the lamb. Now you go to the time of the cross, Jesus is the lamb of God, he dies for our sins. And God tells you and I, do you want my grace? Do you want my grace? If you want my grace, you want my forgiveness, you want my mercy, it's yours. I want you to have it. But you've got to come under the blood of the Lamb. You've got to commit your life to Christ and submit your life to Christ. And if you commit and submit who you are to Jesus, I will show you life like you can't imagine. And at that moment, the, the devil has no power in your life anymore. He can't do anything. You know why? Because you're completely forgiven. You're completely forgiven. And so that means like right now, if the devil's in heaven wanting to accuse me, you know, he can say to God, God, I don't know why you love Chuck. You know, he says he's a Christian, but look how he drives. He just cut off two people and he doesn't care. I mean, look at that. And Jesus goes, I, I didn't see that. You know why? Because he's looking through the blood of the lamb. He goes, I, I didn't see Chuck do that. Whoa, cool, cool Jeep, Chuck. But, uh... <laughs> He doesn't see it. And then the devil goes, look, look how he's treating his body. You gave him that body, and look how he treats his body. It's supposed to be the temple of the spirit. He's turning it into a cathedral. And, uh, you know. And the Lord goes, that's not what I see. I think Chuck looks pretty good. Chuck, you look good. Yeah. You know why? Because he sees me through the blood of the lamb. You know? And, and what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know what? The devil's telling you you're worthless. And God goes, oh, no. You are worth so much that I sent my only son to die on the cross for you. You're worth the blood of Jesus. You couldn't be worth more than you are. The, 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 the devil tells you, you're not desirable. And God goes, oh, I want you to be my child. I don't want to just be your God. I want to be your dad. You're desirable. The devil's telling you your life is, doesn't have any meaning. You're just taking up space. And, and, and the Lord says, no. And I wrote out a plan for your life and a destiny for you that's incredible. And I gave you gifts to accomplish it. See, that's what God's telling you. He's telling you those things. And he's saying, I love you. I care about you. You're worthy. You're worth it. And, and the devil's trying to tell you you're not. And, and yet, if you're under the blood of the lamb, you have God's protection and you have God's promises. Then the next thing is this, because of the word of your testimony. Now, it's not just testimony about Jesus. It's that your life now has such meaning. You've got a story to tell. See, when you take that spiritual gift and you begin to commit your life to the Lord, man, people can see something in you. You're a person of love and not hate. You're a person of kindness and not meanness. The way you handle conflict is different. The way you handle problems is different. The way you care about people is different. And, and so now you have a testimony, and people are able to see, man, that, that you are a different person. And by the way, 
The vast majority of people want to be around someone like that, which means they're going to want to be around you. And that's the second thing. You have a word of testimony. There's evidence you're a Christian. Then the third thing is this. The third thing is because they did not love their life, even when faced in death. And that's because this, we have victory when we love Jesus more than life itself. When we're willing to die to self, which means we're not going to be selfish or self-seeking. We're going to be selfless and serving. And, and at that point, we deny self. Now, right now, right now, there are Christians around the world who are having to choose Jesus and then die. In India, there were Christians beaten to death because they were, they were Christians. All they had to do is say, I won't be a Christian. That, but they didn't. They wouldn't give up. There are over 40 pastors in Iran who have been kidnapped and imprisoned. We don't even know where they are. And all they had to do to stop that from happening is say they wouldn't be Christians. And we live in a world today where people are paying that price, and, and the day's coming, it'll get worse. But let me tell you that before that day comes now, we have victory now because we are selfless and we die to self. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 24. He said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must, he must deny himself and take up his cross, which means die to self, and follow me, which means follow the plan God has for your life. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But... Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Your soul is what matters most. And Jesus said, man, you're going to find life. You're going to find health in your soul. And you've got you to be willing to deny self. And, and what does that mean? That means, you know what? When, when I'm a husband to Pam like I need to be, I'm like, Lord, how can I put my needs aside and lift her up and serve her and deny self? And by the way, then I'm going to have a better marriage and a better life, right? Uh, when, when my son Tim, he's now in his 30s, when Tim was little, he was a talker. Anybody have a child who's a talker? Like, all of a sudden, they start talking, and it's like, take a breath, buddy. You know, and he was so filled with life. And I remember one time, I'd had one of those tiring days, and I'm driving home, and I thought, if I could just sit still on the couch for five minutes. I just want, anybody ever have that happen? And, and I, I go in the house, and I sit on the couch, and all of a sudden, I hear him coming. And man, he is talking before he gets there. And he's got to tell me about this superhero that did that, and the battle he fought, and, and the shield he threw, and the hammer, and he's going on. And he's so excited. And by the way, I've heard this story 15 times. And everything inside me said, tell him to stop. That's called self. Then the Holy Spirit said, don't you do that. Don't you do that. And I picked that little guy up and I put him on my lap and I said, tell me again, buddy. And he told me again and again and again. <laughs> All these years later, I'm so glad that I did what the Holy Spirit said. And you're always going to be glad you do what the Holy Spirit says. And you don't, you don't live life for self. You live life for Jesus and serving others. And it makes all the difference. And then all the change comes. All the change comes. And the change is real. All the time we've seen people experience the born again moment where they give their life to Christ. We've seen people come to this church who felt like they couldn't be in church, who felt like they couldn't be valued, who didn't know they could be accepted, who didn't know that they had so much that God wanted for them. And we've seen broken people find wholeness and healing and, and hope. Ashley came to us that way. Ashley came to us hurting. She had experienced evil in her life. But God wanted her to know she was worthy. God wanted her to know that he loved her. And I want you to hear Ashley's story right now. When I was a young girl, I experienced evil. I was molested when I was eight, and then again when I was 10, and um, then again when I was 15. The abuse didn't stop when it got worse. I had decided that it just God probably wasn't real, and if he was, he hated me, so I walked away. I just gave up. Because of how I felt about myself, I uh, made choices in finding men that didn't value me, getting into abusive relationships, getting into relationships that affirmed how I felt about myself. It was it was like more evil in my life and it was from people that I thought loved me. 
The more that um, it was reinforced that I was not worth anything, that I was not valued, and that this is what love was, it gave me a very distorted sense of that, of love. And I was um, staying away from church. I would not go to church anymore. I felt dirty, and I felt ugly, and mm, like I didn't belong there. And it was made very clear to me because of how people treated me. I had driven by crossroads many times, and I, I had decided to go very reluctantly one Saturday night. And I remember um, feeling like I shouldn't be here, and I kind of couldn't wait to leave. I was sitting by myself in the back, and a, a girl came up to me, and she, she had this big, beautiful smile, and she was so nice and kind, and I just thought that if she knew how much God hated me, she wouldn't want to talk to me. Chuck gave the invitation, and he had paused for a minute, and when he started praying again, time just stood still. I felt like everything and everyone just disappeared, and I felt like I couldn't move, and almost like my it took my breath away. He prayed for a woman who had been staying away from church. She has been abused, and she's been hurt, and she's hurting really bad. And she feels like you abandoned her, and that you don't love her. But God, you want her to know that you never left her. And I remember crying, because it was the first time in what felt like so long that I had felt God. And then I knew, I knew that he loved me, even though I didn't want him. Jesus met me in my pain and in my brokenness. Even when I didn't want him, he wanted me. That made me free from all of the, the lies that the enemy was telling me. That I am loved and that he is good no matter what. In any situation, he is good. I decided to give my life to the Lord. And a few weeks later, uh, I asked my dad to baptize me and I got baptized at Crossroads and I started uh, getting involved. I got into a life group and serving in uh, the greeting ministry and I realized that there are always going to be trials and evil in the world. But God reminded me of who he says that I am. And I started living as though that were true, living as though I know who God says I am and nothing will change that. Wow, wow, wow. And I'm gonna say something, I'm only gonna say it, I haven't said it yet in any other service, I'm gonna say it now. Someone's here and this story is your story. God in his infinite wisdom knew that story was for you. And he wanted you to hear it. And he wants you to know he loves you. And he wants you to come to him just like Ashley did. That's your story. And the rest of the story that she's experiencing is what you're meant to experience. And what do you need to do right now? You need to do what we all need to do if we want to come close to God. If you want to have God's love, you can have it. You can be as close to God as you want to be. That's what the Bible says. He wants to be close to you. The Bible says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And so right now, this person, whoever you are, that God wanted you to hear this story, and all the rest who need God, there are two things you do to begin a journey with God, to begin to live a life with God. The first is you tell him, you pray, and I'm going to lead a prayer in a moment where you can whisper that prayer and tell God, yes, I want you, I want your love, and I want the life you have for me. And I want to be completely forgiven and cleansed. No guilt, no shame. I want to be just new, better than new. You tell him that, and you're going to find Jesus coming close to you and, and his love upon you. That's when you come under the blood of the Lamb. Then the second step is this you got to make it known. You got to make it known. 
Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. Which means if you make it known to everybody you love me, I'm gonna make that love even more real in your life. And so after we pray the prayer where you commit or recommit your life to Christ, some of you need to recommit, I'm gonna ask everyone here to stand and sing. And I'm gonna say, please, please, don't slip out during that time because you're gonna be distracting someone else. Just wait till the end of the song. Do it for them, do it for the Lord. But then after we stand and sing, if that's you, you prayed that prayer of commitment, you feel God calling you, you're ready for what God has for you. Make your way to an aisle or to the stairs. People would love to let you out. Walk down one of these aisles and let us greet you up here. And then head in this room we call the living room. And in there we want to know your name. We want to give you a Bible. We want to give you a booklet to help you know how to get even closer to Christ. But something happens when you pray that prayer and you make that walk. It goes deep. It goes strong. And God wants it for you. Oh, God wants it for you. But you got to come. you got to choose to come. And don't hold back because you're holding back on you. God wants you. God loves you. And God wants this for you. And there, again, there's more than one person, but one person in particular. God wanted you to hear that story. It's your story. But boy, the rest of the life he has for you is so amazing. So right now, I'm going to ask us to pray the prayer. To pray the prayer and say yes to Jesus. You can pray it alone. You can pray it as a couple. You can pray it as friends. Uh, and then after we pray the prayer and we stand to sing, if you want to grab someone's hand and say, come with me, you can. But make that walk. If you have your kids, bring your kids. Have them see you make this decision. And again, you could come as a couple. But let's let God move. Open up your heart to God right now. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now for every person who's here that needs to commit or recommit their life to you. People right now who could have your love, have your protection. There's a person here, Lord. Not the person I was thinking of, another one. They need your protection. They, there's so much fear in their life and they're afraid for a very real reason. They need your protection and I pray they're gonna say yes to you and, and what's going on and the kind of pressure they're experiencing from someone else, Lord, they can be set free from. I pray they're gonna come. Lord, I pray for couples that need to pray this prayer together and their, li their children's lives are gonna change. I pray for a couple here who's getting ready to get married, but Lord, they need to put you at the center of their relationship. So God, I pray right now there's people who's gonna say yes. If that's you, I'm gonna ask you to think about it. Man, God loves you, but you're a prayer away from all he has for you. And if that's you, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know you love me. So those words, I know you love me, because he does. Say, I know you died on the cross for me. And I wanna be under the blood of the lamb. I wanna be under your protection. I wanna have your Holy Spirit. I want to be cleansed and free from all sin and guilt and shame. I want to be yours. And just say those words, I want to be yours. And this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And amen if you prayed that prayer. Amen if you prayed that prayer.